Nightingale first appeared in Bright Falls during episode 3 of the first Alan Wake game. He was summoned by Paul Randolph, the owner of the trailer park. Despite identifying himself as an FBI agent, Nightingale had actually been suspended from duty because of his excessive drinking and reckless actions. His suspension came after the mysterious death of his former partner, Finn. I didn't recognize him in his current state, but yeah, I ran into him a few times at Quantico. Never worked any cases together. After his partner got killed in the field, he went off the deep end. Got the boot pretty quick after that. Nightingale has been in Bright Falls for an undisclosed period, investigating the author Alan Wake. He strongly believes that Wake's resemblance to a haunting figure from his nightmares is linked to his colleague Finn's demise. Throughout the game, Nightingale attempts to capture Alan on several occasions. When Alan and Barry unwind at the Anderson Farms, enjoying some moonshine, Nightingale manages to track them down. Despite being highly emotional, he can't bring himself to harm them and takes them to the sheriff's station instead. While there, he's attacked by the Dark Presence, but similar to Rose Marigold, he isn't entirely consumed by it. He's mostly absent for the rest of the story until the final cutscene, where he's seen behind Rose in a fortified house. At the beginning of Alan Wake 2, we take control of Nightingale, who emerges from Cauldron Lake only to be killed by the Cult of the Tree. This cult aims to prevent Nightingale from returning as an embodiment of the Dark Presence, a process they've successfully performed with other Taken emerging from the lake before. However, they are disrupted by the Bookers. The cult attempts to complete the ritual later, but they are unsuccessful in preventing his return. The idea here is that Scratch and Tom incorporated Nightingale into the script of Return, using him as a character in the search for the Clicker. This device was crucial for Scratch to bring his stories to life. Cauldron Lake has the power to manipulate reality through art, but the clicker acts as an enhancer. Without it, changes might take a lot of time to materialize, allowing external forces, like Wake for example, to potentially alter or undo those changes. However, the clicker speeds up this process, making the alterations almost instantaneous. <coughs> Nightingale rises as a Taken in the Sheriff's Station morgue. As Saga attacks him, he disappears into an overlap, some kind of half-separate dimension space, quite literally an overlapping between the dark place and the main game world. With the help of Wake's manuscript pages, Saga tracks down Nightingale into the overlap and is able to finish him off. Nightingale is actually quite an interesting case, since we don't know that much about him as a character, compared to some other people in the story. One of the biggest questions with everyone appearing in the Ellen Wake narrative is if they are a fictional creation or if they are modeled after a real-life person. With many characters, like Alex Casey for example, there are hints that there is an actual individual somewhere in the world of the Remedy universe that these characters are based on, so they are never completely made up from scratch. But with Nightingale this becomes a bit unclear due to our lack of tangible information. Does he actually exist outside the narrative of departure and later return? Would people outside the area of effect of this AWE know about him? As you regular listeners know, I tend to work through the night, but I'm not the only one. Deputies Mulligan and Thornton are taking a couple of moments off their busy schedule to join me here in the studio. Boys, how busy are you now? Mulligan and Thornton are two sheriff's deputies in Bright Falls. Mulligan makes his debut in the Bright Falls miniseries Episode 4, attempting to capture Shell Dyke after she's affected by the Dark Presence. During the encounter, she bites his hand. Later, Mulligan investigates Jake Fisher's trashed room at the Mountain Air Hotel, but he either fails to recognize that Jake could be responsible or chooses not to acknowledge it. In the events of the first Alan Wake game, Mulligan is one of the officers summoned by Robert Nightingale to track down Alan and Barry. Although he's not visible during most of the game, he's frequently mentioned, such as in interviews conducted at Pat Main's radio station. Mulligan seems lazy and sarcastic, but he's not really a bad person. He wants people to take him seriously and sometimes acts like he knows more than he does, especially around important people. He's always lived in Bright Falls and tried to become sheriff before, but he's never been picked for the job. Thornton works as Mulligan's junior partner, and both are tasked by Sheriff Breaker to meet FBI agents Saga Anderson and Alex Casey. He's a popular staff member known for his upbeat, sincere nature. He can be overly enthusiastic at times and tends to take jokes 
bit too seriously. He moved to Bright Falls seeking a peaceful life. His lively personality contrasts with Mulligan's more quieter demeanor, and they often squabble with each other. I just figured that, you know, that, uh... Where are those damn show up, Mulligan? Federal agent's right here, Thornton. My partner Thornton, <laughs> down at crime scene. He's not what you call the sharpest axe in the shed. Right here? What do you mean? Are they with you? Oh. Later, it is revealed that Thornton and Mulligan are also members of the Cult of the Tree, safeguarding Bright Falls from beings taken by the Dark Presence emerging from Cauldron Lake. However, they do operate uh, somewhat independently and accidentally kill an innocent woman at some point, Monica Thompson, disposing of her body in the coffee world well to evade suspicion. This event made them feel increasingly guilty and at some point, likely influenced by Scratch's writing, they steal the clicker, an item safeguarded by a cult of the tree. When Ellen explores the poet's cinema, he lives through a story that has certain parallels with the events that happened to Thornton and Mulligan during Return. The two police officers in the story definitely represent the deputies, with Ilmo being the cult member they are trying to impress to be initiated. This suggests that being a member of the cult or the torchbearers before must come with a certain prestige within Bright Falls. This is very very obviously a reference to Twin Peaks' Bookhouse Boys. Mulligan and Thornton initially downplay the seriousness of their situation, leading to increased guilt and influencing their decisions negatively. This vulnerability makes them perfect targets for manipulation by the Dark Presence. Saga follows the two officers taken by the Dark Presence into another overlap, where she defeats them and gets the clicker. Just a quick reminder, if you enjoyed the video so far, click the like button and consider subscribing to my channel to stay up to date with any future videos that I make. It really helps me out a lot and you are awesome. Thank you. In the first Alan Wake game, Cynthia Weaver was known as the Lady of Light in Bright Falls because she constantly carried a lantern. She had a strong fixation on light and set up various light sources in town to defend it against the dark presence. She was a devoted fan of the poet Tom Zane, who communicated with her from the dark place through TVs, lights and dreams, guiding her in preparing the town against the Taken and arranging a shoebox with his old belongings, like the clicker, for Ellen. Cynthia harbored feelings for Tom and felt envious of his fiancée Barbara, a trait she shared with Rose Marigold in regards to Alan Wake. I knew them both, Tom and Barbara. I had such a crush on him. Such a beautiful man. I was jealous. There was a part of me that was maybe a little glad when she had the accident. <laughs> In the 70s, Cynthia was an aspiring writer who joined the artist's commune established by Tom Zane at Cauldron Lake, together with Emil Hartman and some other artists. She therefore does have a certain insight into some of the things that happened during the time of Tom's stay in the area. However, she was most likely influenced by the reality-altering stories in some way, since she does only remember Tom the poet, who Zane himself claims during various occasions is a character he played in one of his movies. Both Jesse's psychiatrist from the game Control, a person who was very likely outside the area of influence of the Bright Falls AWE, and Ati, who is probably a supernatural being that is not affected by these events the same way as humans, addressed Tom as a filmmaker. After Ellen vanished in Cauldron Lake, Cynthia grew older and wary from her responsibilities. She eventually moved to Valhalla Nursing Home, passing on her Lady of the Light duties to Rose Marigold. Cynthia used to scold the caretaker Vladimir Bloom for not changing the lights properly, and even though she aged, she did it herself until she couldn't anymore. Following messages supposedly from Ellen, Rose took Cynthia's angel lamp and threw it into the dark place for Ellen's use, leaving Cynthia saddened as it was one of the last things she had from Tom. While at the nursing home, she received romantic attention from rock musician Tor Anderson, but her fixation on Zane worsened. Her paranoia and despair over Zane made her more susceptible to the influence of the dark presence. Her advancing age caused carelessness, leading to a broken light in her bathroom as she forgot to replace it. This allowed the dark presence to enter while she was bathing and drown her in the tub. Ellen at some point even glimpses her lifeless body in the dark place. Subsequently, she transforms into a Taken and abducts Tor Anderson in order to slow down Saga. Deal with the nasty Anderson fellow. His heart was broken. Cancelled. Leaks started appearing. It was too late. Shut her out of her own case. Saga finds Cynthia in another overlap, defeats her and rescues Tor. 
Now, this is where the biggest spoilers for Alan Wake 2 are coming up, so be warned. There is also a lot that we still don't know about the character Scratch, so be aware that some things I talk about are nothing but speculation. I will try to be as thorough as possible with providing sources for all the things that I say, but if I forget about something, feel free to leave a comment below the video. Scratch was the term for an evil version of Alan Wake that appeared in several games before. Initially, people never mentioned his name. Instead, only the sound of a scratching needle on a vinyl record player was heard. Don't mind him. He's Mr. Scratch. Your friends will meet him when you're born. He was initially mentioned in Departure, after Alan dispelled the tornado. Alan caught sight of him beneath the lake while Thomas Zane explained what Alan needed to do to conquer the Dark Presence. Zane offered no clear explanation, only suggesting your friends will encounter him when you're absent, hinting that while Alan is trapped at the place, this alternate version of him might be outside. Twin Peaks anyone? In Alan Wake 2, we learn more about Scratch. It seems probable that Scratch is a manifestation of a split personality that emerged in Alan's mind when he stopped writing. After Alan completed Departure and became trapped in the Dark Place, he persisted in writing and experimenting with the powers he encountered. One likely motive was to maintain control over the Dark Place and the Dark Presence. And additionally, he probably sought ways to escape his confinement. During that period, Alan encountered Thomas Zane, the filmmaker, distinct from the diver poet, and they collaborated to create art as an escape from the dark place. At this point, Tom had likely been in the dark place for quite a while, possibly running out of creative ideas due to numerous failed attempts with the power of the dark place. Collaborating with Alan likely offered Tom a fresh perspective and excitement. However, Alan's attempt also repeatedly failed and he gradually descended into madness. He realized that his endeavors were causing harm to people, suggesting that while he harnessed the power of the lake, the outcomes were distressing to him. This realization led Alan to decide to stop writing. This choice, however, did not sit well with the Dark Presence or with Zane. Both saw Alan as a means to escape, viewing his decision to cease writing as a barrier to their exit. The Dark Presence likely started influencing Alan from the moment he entered the Dark Place. It couldn't fully take him, possibly due to him being a para-utilitarian, or because it needed Alan himself to access the powers of the lake. Taking him would have been counterproductive. Yet Alan's prolonged despair from repeated failures allowed the Dark Presence to take a stronger hold, resulting in the creation of a kind of split personality, Scratch. This is familiar. Oh, this is familiar. I, I've been here before. The manuscript page titled The Genesis of Mr. Scratch reveals that Scratch emerged from Cauldron Lake's power formed from all the dark tales and rumors surrounding Alan Wake during his time in the Dark Place. I see Scratch as an entity born from a blend of the Dark Presence and Alan Wake himself. Simplifying it to just the presence within Alan's body seems too straightforward to me. Alan and Scratch are the same person, but at the same time, they are not. They are different parts of what makes up Alan's identity, probably reinforced by the power of the Dark Place. After all, when an author creates a character, they always put a little bit of themselves in it. This perception is reinforced by a conversation Alan has with Tom the Poet in the writer DLC of the original Alan Wake game. When Alan asks Tom if there are two versions of him, Tom answers yes. Alan then inquires if Mr. Scratch is also him, but Tom darkly responds no. Alan is left very perplexed by this revelation. While we could delve into a lengthy philosophical discussion about what defines a person or identity, let's just 
put that aside for now. In Alan Wake's American Nightmare, Mr. Scratch assumes a prominent role as the primary antagonist, ultimately being defeated by Alan with the assistance of a movie created by his fiancée, Alice. Currently, however, the game's connection to the canon of the series is not entirely clear. So for now, I'll consider it as a metaphorical showdown between Alan and Scratch within the dark place or within Alan's mind. Scratch meets up with Tom Zane and they continue to work together on Return until Scratch finishes his text and leaves Zane. However, something doesn't work. Return does not free him from the dark place. The pathway for Scratch or the Dark Presence to take control was through another artistic creation, a story named Initiation, serving as a prequel to Return. Essentially, this is the narrative Alan experiences in the second game. It concludes with Alan discovering Alice's death, marking his lowest point in the hero's journey. It's at this juncture that the Dark Presence seizes control and transforms him into Scratch. We also learned that Scratch existed within the Dark Place, at least for a while, co-writing Return with Zane. However, Scratch eventually abandoned Zane, exiting the Dark Place alone. He manipulated Saga Anderson by having her find the Clicker and summoning him to Bright Falls. Now, this officially introduces time travel into the Alan Wake storyline, shattering any hope of analyzing the lower order story in a linear manner. It's safe to say that this door is closed now. Scratch's newfound freedom and possession of the clicker raise intriguing questions about his intentions and goals. What does Scratch actually want? Or what does the Dark Presence actually want? It wants to escape the Dark Place, yes, but what then? From Alan Wake 1 we get that the Dark Presence, in the original ending to Departure, wants the whole town or even the whole world engulfed in darkness. But how would that manifest and what exactly does that mean for the world outside the Dark Place? Upon regaining control of the unaffected Alan, we explore a transformed Bright Falls, stuck in an eternal Deerfest. Is that what the entity desires? A halt to change? This reality is not even really dark, it is probably the brightest sequence in the whole game. Now this is actually where things get a bit confusing for me, so if you have any wild, crazy or awesome ideas, feel free to share them in the comments. Playing Alan Wake 2 was actually a very enjoyable experience, especially considering its lore and connections to Control, a game that I really loved. Remedy's efforts to expand its interconnected universe by integrating other games really intrigues me. It's a perfect opportunity for me to dive into my little conspiracy theories and delve deep into the details of the games, a habit you might know from my previous videos. And hopefully I'll be able to create more content on these games soon. If you want to stay updated, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell and all that jazz. Ultimately, I just hope you enjoyed the video, have a fantastic day and goodbye. On this one empty world What are you looking at? Is it your face on a pane of glass? Cause somehow this window becomes a trap On this one empty world Will it ever let me go? Forever I am Fading to black Forever Circling back Just to fall into this trap This trap